As you can see behind me here this afternoon, I have Diane Victor's um, monument, which was done in 2014. Uh, and the reason why we sort of thought about having this conversation around this particular image or this particular painting is because of the kinds of, I suppose, emancipatory potential that exists within the imaginative space as it were. And what I'm hoping that today's conversation will be able to facilitate is the capacity to reimagine society and reimagine masculinities in many instances, because what I find challenging, what I find problematic in many respects is that we're recycling the old story around masculinities, which I'm fairly bored with in many instances or in many respects. Um, you know, it's the same old chat and I think it's time that we sort of get into a space that's a bit more different and a bit more um, exciting and new. So welcome to the series, the Femicide series, uh, that is hosted jointly between the University of Pretoria's Political Science Department as well as the Javit UP Art Center. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have, you, to have you join us today. So welcome, Eldrin. And I think the first thing for me is to um, pose the question to you of, or to sort of contextualize why it is that I decided to invite you onto the series. It's because I am a huge fan, first and foremost, of your Power Talk uh, slot on Power FM. Uh, and consistently what I've noticed is that on your show, at least once every two weeks, the question of gender uh, and gender-based violence comes up, right? And I know you're not necessarily an expert on gender and gender-based violence, but I am curious about the ways in which you negotiate that recurrent conversation on your show? It's quite difficult, I have to admit. Um, I didn't expect it to be as difficult as it is. This is now being a reporter moving into the space of where you're actually the one who moderates and facilitates these conversations. Because I come from a background where I'm just the journalist who gets to ask the questions of um, the people who are mourning or the victim and then put the question out there or put the, the sound bites out there and let people have a conversation. So I'm always, um, I'm not part of the conversation, you know, this is now as a reporter, but now moving into the space of talk radio, you are now forced to be part of the conversation and to engage on the conversation as well. And what it does, it also um, expects of you to share your personal experiences and how you've experienced gender-based violence. And I think that's the reason why I have gone through a very, emotional, I would say, roller coaster <laughs> of um, self-discovery, um, self-identity, and also what the notion of dignity and justice mean versus the notion of, of, of identity and where I locate myself in all of this as well. So yes, it has been quite difficult, I have to say, and there's a lot of learning and unlearning that I realize um, that we all have to go through when we have the conversation around gender-based violence. For instance, uh, there was a day that we had a conversation on GBV as well, and I think this was just after the president has made the announcement around some of the steps that are being taken to deal with GBV. This is now last year. And one of the guests that I had the question that I asked, which was raised before, was someone had argued, and this is now part of the activist as well in the space of GBV, and just to show you as well that there is no one set approach or correct approach, some would argue, to deal with the issue of gender-based violence. There could be a multi-pronged approach to this. So one of the issues that, um, that arose during that the conversation was someone had argued that why are we calling it gender-based violence when we know it is women who suffer the most. So why isn't it being called women-based violence? And the argument uh, from one of our panelists was that it can't be women-based violence because what we find as well is that within the realm of GBV, you find even women being violent towards other women. So it is about the gender and the gender being women. And she makes an example further to argue that if you look in, um, if you look at a relationship, for instance, between a between a, lesbians, for instance, you know, you'd find that the more um, macho, the more masculine um, uh, a partner in the relationship, who is said to assume the role of being the man in that relationship, tend to also have the characteristics displayed by men on a daily basis. So you'd find that there's also the beating up that happens because that person who comes across as muscular 
who has this masculinity, muscular characteristics to, to, to themselves and their own identity, also now want to assume this role that is a role that some may argue is only a role for men. And men are violent, we are told. But here is somebody who is a woman, but who has these characteristics that, that men display, and who also then becomes violent. And that then brings us to the question around what is masculinity? Are we arguing that masculinity is only the sole trait of men? Are, are we saying that it intersects? It intersects even with, with femininity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and thanks for that, Elgin, because you anticipate uh, a question um, which I had hoped to pose later, but I think uh, the way in which you're framing your contribution necessitates that I ask this question now, right, which is this idea of if we think about, if we think about, for instance, the sort of dominant um, ideas around masculinity within society at the moment, right? Does our conception, for instance, of masculinity accommodate alternative modes of existence, right? So for instance, I'm thinking about queer bodies, I'm thinking about gender nonconformist bodies, um, because I think part of the script that we have developed so far is that we are consistently chatting about masculinity in these historical conceptions, yeah. right? So a man is strong, a man is supposed to be a provider, a man is supposed mm -hmm. to be this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that those strictures don't necessarily, for me in any case, in terms of how I conceptualize masculinity and the cultivation of masculinity in society, mm -hmm. they don't speak to the nuanced kind of existences that exist out there in the world, right? So, so the question I would pose to you is, would you suggest maybe that the current conception of masculinity is shifting, is opening up to be accommodative to alternative modes of existence? Mm -hmm. um, and if it is, how is it doing that work? If it isn't, what are we doing as men to facilitate that opening up of that space, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. But is that assuming that women want to, want to be part of that space? Well, that's a good question. Um, I would suggest that for now, at this particular point in time, let's sort of suspend the question of women being part of the masculine yeah. space, right? Because in many respects, I'm, I'm interested in how we as men talk about masculinities, first of mm -hmm. all, how we mm -hmm. fashion masculinities, even before we go out and relate with other people, right? So last mm -hmm. week's um, conversation with uh, Chilu as well as Courtney was talking to this question of how it is that in many respects, masculinities are being imagined or reimagined within society and how it is that we can sort of create or articulate a conception of masculinity that addresses healthy masculinities through the imagination. The previous conversation that we had with Sandy Africa, Lisa Fetten, as well as um, Dogozo Mbogazi, uh, talked to this idea. Lisa suggested that as men, we are very violent and we are killing everything. We're killing women, we're killing each other, we're killing everybody, right? So yeah. I'm interested first and foremost in how we change that script in the sense of how do we as men relate and relate to the concept of masculinity and whether we are willing to accommodate mm -hmm. alternative conceptions of masculinity and alternative articulations of masculinity for that matter. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question then, and we, the conversation needs to start from a point of view that are we saying that mm, are men okay with um, abdicating this throne that have been given to them by society? Are we okay with that? Is it important? Is it important to share that space? Because when we speak about that space, um, in terms of our positionality as men as well, we speak about power and access to power. So are we okay with sharing that power? But another big conversation to this is, um, and I know that as we have this conversation around locating violence and, and the mode of, of mourning as well, is are we okay with the sense of loss? That I have lost something that has, given me a sense of identity, my sense of identity that says that when I walk into this household, I am the man of the house and therefore I am the provider and this is what I've always been doing. However, now, now that space is now being, uh, being, uh, being contested. It's being contested by other men, of course, and this, it, this also applies for, um, for, for white males. That yes. space of you being right there at the top, that space is now being, being contested. Are you okay with that level of competition and are you okay with losing out? Then we come to a um, conversation around the black male. Are you okay 
um, as this man who may argue that I have experienced oppression from a white community and therefore I now find my sense of worth when I am at home, where I am being called the provider, Ikanda, the muzi, the, the head of the household. Am I okay with the notion that now that may not be the case? And those are the very difficult conversations that we need to have, I think, as, 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 as guys. But that's a struggle as well. I just want to come in there to say, I think, I think about you know, some of the work that's happening at the moment around the changing modalities of society and how women mm. are now, for instance, in heterosexual contexts, right? Because, yes. and, and, and this is why I'm also kind of wary about the conversation because mm. it always tends to go back to that very heterosexual kind yeah. of cisgender society. But anyway, um, women are now starting to, to challenge the idea of the man as the provider. You'll find, for mm-hmm. instance, in the household Mm -hmm. where the woman is earning far more than the male, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. is the one who's shouldering much of the financial responsibility. Now, are we supposed Mm -hmm. to think of that as an emasculating kind of setup for the man? And I think if that's the if that's the suggestion, and that in many instances always is the suggestion, right? The man yeah. feels emasculated. The woman has to shrink herself because she needs to give the man the, the, the feeling that he is still the mm-hmm. provider, which I think is nonsensical. And that for me is what is a derivative setup or derivative context of the toxicity of masculinity that we have, which is not even to, to, to think about if we complicate the conversation uh, with respect to what, what happens in a space that is defined by two men right, who are coexisting, building a household, raising a family. What happens in the context of two women who are coexisting, yeah. building a household, that kind of thing. I think it's, for me, the, 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 the sort of, as, and, that, and that's the reason why I pose the question to say, as, mascul- as, as, as the bearers of masculinity, are mm-hmm. we in a space of reimagining and how do we begin to facilitate that reimagination within society, if that makes sense? Yeah. Again, when, when, when we speak about uh, being emasculated, what are we speaking about? What is being emasculated, you know? Uh, what does it mean for you as a man? When you say that I feel that I've been emasculated, what does it mean? I think the biggest issue is actually a sense of, of loss, the point that I, that I raised earlier on, and having to be able to deal with loss. If we speak about grieve, grieving, for instance, let's say you've lost a loved one, um, there are the processes around mourning, for instance, that we that we speak of, that this is how you deal with mourning. Because even if we do say, and we argue that um, masculinity is a exclusive trait of, of males, then we must also say that that means when, 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 when we speak about emasculating, there is a sense of loss. So if there is the sense of loss, how do we then deal with the mourning process? So you, you, you're gonna feel, you're gonna to touch the grief, you're gonna feel the pain, that right now I've been emasculated. I'm gonna make, make a quick example. Um, as a guy, for instance, you see, well, as a heterosexual male, see your girlfriend with another man. Um, in that moment, how do you feel? Um, do I feel that young Do I feel emasculated? So now that is the pain, that is the sorrow that I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling that pain. But then what do I then do after that? What do I do with the sense of loss that I felt, that I feel even that I've been embarrassed in public? I saw a video the other day, a guy, I think, tried to run into a, a, a police van, if I'm not mistaken, or something, something along those lines, but there were women around him as well. And these women kept on shouting at him and shouting at him and shouting at him. And so forth, you know? So his manhood is really coming under attack. His sense of self-worth is that I am the man, I'm the dominant character, and I am the one who carries power in the power dynamics that I play here, came under attack. However, though, he then goes into the car, and then the woman then stands in front of the car, and then what he does, he drives into her. So what is that thing that makes him drive into her? Is it because he feels embarrassed in that moment? Again, it goes back to that sense of, a sense of loss. But why can't we be okay with losing out? And that's the thing, the conversation that we're having on, on radio as well, that when we speak about um, the socialization of human beings, that is, we always teach human beings to achieve, to achieve, to achieve, to achieve. So constantly you have to win. In moments where you do not win, in moments where you fail, even in a debate, 
how do you deal with that sense of loss and feeling of of failure and that's the conversation as males that we are struggling with you look for instance at um, look at a soccer game soccer match mm-hmm. chiefs pirates chiefs versus pirates uh, pirates loses and all of a sudden all the chairs from from the grandstands have now have have to be ripped off why i think that's an interesting one because in many respects that i think for me feeds into um, a broader conversation, right, around yeah. precisely the questions of socialization. Yeah. But also, it suggests for me, and maybe I might be wrong, but it suggests mm. for me a certain sense of arrogance, right, yeah. um, on the part of masculinity. If, if masculinity consistently responds with violence yeah. when confronted with a sense of, as you say, loss, um, I think that's just I think that's just fundamentally very arrogant, and that of course we can attach that to a number of things. One of which mm-hmm. is the idea of how our society has shifted in many respects. Because you talk about something that was I think that's very very important about particular identities that had sort of occupied the apex of society, right? Cis heterosexual middle aged white man, right? Um, and in many respects, the the the, the attendant ideology. That, it, that constitutes that identity, which is economic proliferation, economic gain at whatever cost, mm-hmm. at, whatever, at whatever particular end, or, you know what I mean? And I think in many instances, we've begun to internalize yeah. those kinds of identities as peripheral masculinities because we are aspiring to that kind of apex identity. Um, and that, and that, that points to a very, very arrogant kind of existence, which, which brings me to the sort of um, one of the earlier questions that I wanted to pose to you, which is this sort of question around um, your particular function and role as somebody who is tasked and entrusted with the sort of ideal of telling and narrating the nation's story, right? And I think about, for instance, Ben Okri's work um, in Ways of Being Free, where he makes the claim that to Poison a nation, poison its stories. A demoralized nation tells demoralized stories to itself. He further goes on to say, beware of the storytellers who are not fully conscious of the importance of their gifts and who are responsible in the application of their art. Mm. They could unwittingly help along the psychic destruction of their people. And I'm curious from your particular perspective, Aldrin, as somebody who's both on television as well as on radio, whether you view the current media conversation, public national narrative of South Africa as one that facilitates imagining new possibilities. And of course, we can attach a lot of that, a lot of what we're facing right now to that question, right? So the question of corruption, the question of gender-based violence, the question of the political the political bankruptcy in terms of leadership that we have in this country at the moment. Is the public narrative, the public discourse in this country, facilitating ways of um, facilitating ways of viewing or, or, or telling new stories or imagining new possibilities in the country? Do you think? Um, I'll start off by saying that any person who has a position of authority um, has the duty to speak on the social ills that we go through as a nation. Mm -hmm. So whether you are a politician, whether you're an academic, um, whether you are a manager in a company, whether you are um, the so-called, what what do they call them again? The the head of the household. This is now whether male or female. Um, So you are in a position of authority. You're in a position where people listen. When you talk, a friend of mine used to say that, you know, when money talks, people listen. (laughs) And that's the reason why sometimes, if you think about it, um, with the family set up as well, when the Magnum Sebeinzi, you'd you'd hear the, hey, no, Simelo Eldren, Uta Afi, before we conclude anything. Because that person has been given that position of authority, that this is our thinker in the family. So therefore this person must be here. So we need to be cognizant of those type of, of positions that we hold because those people who are in positions of authority are then the same people who are confident enough to call into a radio station and share their experiences. Because 
when we speak about um, when we speak about um, a radio station and calling into a talk radio station, especially, there is a level of courage that you need to have mm -hmm. to say that, oh, am I confident and courageous enough to enter this conversation? So you must have gained that courage from somewhere else. And whether we as a radio station has been able to facilitate that and help you gain that courage to be part of a conversation is something else. But where you come from as well is also very important because that then tells us what you are able to bring into the conversation as well and how you're able to articulate yourself and whether you are okay with accepting defeat during a conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So in Lini, you are told that you are the voice of reason. But when you come into a public space, you are told actually you are wrong. Are you okay with being wrong? Mm -hmm. Again, goes back to the point around, are you okay to lose? Mm -hmm. Because if people are not okay to lose, they then close up the, the realm of, of, of robust engagement because their argument would be that this is my truth and therefore I'll stick with my truth. Mm -hmm. And because my argument around the media and the role of the media, people would say that the media is, uh, what's, what's the, what do they call it, a watchdog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what, yeah. That's not true. That is not true. That's not our role as the media. We can't be an iPad of society. iPad is a watchdog of, <laughs> of the police. So we can't be the watchdog of society. You are expecting too little. You are expecting mm -hmm. too little from the media if you only describe the role of the media as being the watchdog of society. Mm -hmm. What we are, we are a reflection of society and we bring that on the airwaves and that's why we must have authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. And all the ideas that exist outside of the space of the media must then be reflected in the space of the media in a more controlled environment because the environment of, of media is more controlled than the environment of a, of a social social setting. School me Brian, Brian is Matugana. You can call yeah. each other hey, your mother, what what you, what what you, what what what. But in media, there are rules. There are certain things that we can do. There are certain things that we can't do. But what I find is that those rules that have been set up there are then used to. Um, uh, I don't know, to, to, to drive mute, a certain story, not even just to drive a certain story, but to, to mute dissenting voices, the voices that do not agree with what society has decided is the right way to go, the norms and standards that society ha has come up with. So I know that when I come into that space, it's a very contested space. First of all, you come into a space where um, you know that this is what society has set as the standard of engagement when it comes to certain issues, how then are you able to challenge that in a way that society is willing to say, okay, let's entertain these new ideas. Let's entertain the ideas of how do we fight, fight gender-based violence from, how do we approach gender-based violence? Um, not really differently, but is there anything else that we can add to the conversation around gender-based violence? Because certainly all of the things that we have been doing so long have not worked that much. Okay. Probably there is some successes, but, but, but I missing, argue... We're, we're failing, we're failing to... to exactly, exactly, so why is that the case? Is that because we are saying that there are a certain way, there, there's a certain way of addressing the gender-based gender violence question, and therefore anything else that falls outside of, of, of what our resolutions are on gender-based violence cannot be entertained? Uh, that, that makes a... I, that's a very interesting point that you raise this question of silencing dissenting or alternative voices right mm -hmm. because for me it goes back to those hegemonic identities right yeah. so which narrative which story do we tell ourselves as a as a country which story mm -hmm. do we buy into um and when that story is challenged how do we as a people as a south africa respond to that kind of, mm -hmm. to that kind of challenge but this brings up something, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of ask for a brief response on this one because it's not necessarily part of the, 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 the conversation as it were, but I want to find out then what happens when we have a dissenting voice, but the dissenting voice brings a perspective that perpetuates problematic identities and problematic modes of thinking in society. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are two options I think that are available to us, right? Mm -hmm. There's the 
proposition of saying why, for instance, Aldrin, do you think in the way that you do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I can, I, can, I can try to understand where you're coming from so that maybe I could be able to then intervene with an alternative perspective. Or I could say, well, Aldrin has these views, I'm just going to cancel him, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what we're seeing at the moment in society. It's this cancel culture that I think is fundamentally very problematic because in many instances, it's very, very anti-intellectual. Um, and it is very, very intellectually trite and very lazy. But anyway, let's not get into that. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm curious about how, what is the role? And that's the, it goes back, I think, to this question that I was asking before to say, as national storytellers, what then becomes your role, for instance, as a reporter, as a journalist, as a primetime radio presenter, when you encounter somebody who brings on a very violent kind of perspective into a conversation of gender-based violence, for instance, and will bring something that, 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 that perpetuates violence against women and, and, and violence against vulnerable groups or feminized bodies, as it were. So, so how, does, how does one curate that space of democratic participation, yeah. right, in terms of the national discourse mm -hmm. um, with, with, the, with the use of democratic participation in very, very problematic ways how does one balance that i wonder okay um number one is when we have conversations what we should try and do is not to create echo chambers because the echo chambers won't help us um challenge society challenge our understanding of what it means to be a human being it won't get us to challenge uh, policies for instance if we all agree on the same thing um, but what gender-based violence tells us as well is that there are those people who are proponents of, 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 um, of, of femicide, actually, and those who believe that women are to be treated like, like children. They do exist. But when you do not put those voices on air to have such conversations, it then almost becomes a myth that people think that it does not exist. It can't be true. We don't hear these voices at all, at all because your circle is so close. You, are so, you have a circle of, let's say, maybe 10 friends. And because these people are your friends, you tend to believe in the same things and, and, and so forth. But there would be moments, of course, that you, that you, that you disagree with each other. But you have this, 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 um, this chain of, 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 of friends that do exist. But with the conversations that you guys have, are there echo chambers? Do you allow for a dissenting voice within that, that, that circle of, 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 of friendship? So if you allow that dissenting voice to find expression in your circle of friends, why shouldn't that dissenting voice find expression on a platform like the radio? So that everyone else can then contribute to that and say that this is my take on this, this is my take on this, this is what I'm saying. Because we can't constantly have the conversation around um, um, the pain of the victim. Mm. It's not enough to just end there. You can't end at just the pain of the victim. You need to now take it beyond the pain of the victim. What are we saying beyond the pain of the victim? What are we saying to this person who says that I believe that I'm entitled to her body? Mm. Because we now need to deal with the, the perpetrator as well. Mm. So what I find that in our, in our approach of gender-based violence, and um, I know that some people would argue that it's a bit controversial, um, in our approach of gender-based violence, we focused on the, on the pain, um, the agony, mm -hmm. the crime that has been committed. We don't deal with the, with the why. Mm. We, we, we struggle to get to the why. And that's the same case even with our, with, our, uh, with our correctional services rehabilitation process, is that what you do get, even in the justice system, is that when a judge delivers a judgment, you get to understand the what happened. So that is the only adjudication that happens. The only adjudication happens around who is guilty and what happened. We haven't dealt with the why. And we need to deal with the why. But when you want to deal with the why, that means that you need to speak to the person who perpetrates the crime mm -hmm. and ask, why do you do this? And of course, the things that they are going to say are going to be problematic because this is their conviction. 
they are coming from a socialization and a space that tells them that I am entitled to that body. Can we hear that voice? And when we put that person on the radio, we're not necessarily saying that this person is right. right. Yeah. We're saying that here is somebody who's bringing something to the table that we need to have a conversation about. Because these people do not only exist on the radio, they exist amongst us. Mm -hmm. So if these voices do not find expression on the radio, they find expression somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And how are we dealing with this? Do we give, are we equipping um, those friends of another friend who's quite problematic who is a proponent of gender-based violence, are we equipping them with the right tools to engage that friend? Great, incredible response, thank you. Uh, which takes me to the next bit, which is the sense of, so you say that we should not sort of limit radio, or not radio, but the media to yeah. this watchdog kind of institution. Mm. Um, however, I am curious about, you know, going back to that question of narrative and the question of imagination and how it is that we are reimagining social identities in South Africa, mm -hmm. whether the media, besides reporting, right? So you talk about asking the question of the why in terms of the perpetrator, mm -hmm. um, while also reporting on the what happened. The what, yeah. But is the, media, is the media going beyond that, right? In the sense of facilitating our understanding of women as mm. citizen in her own right, right? So this idea of, we, we, we understand that the South African context has a brilliant constitution, everybody lords it, although there are those who would otherwise, would think otherwise. And I think that's a conversation for another day and a problematic conversation, you know, in, in a democracy when one is, one can sort of question the legitimacy of democracy, but to question mm. the cornerstone of the democracy, I think that's a bit pushing it. But in any case, um, we, we have this great constitution that, in, that, suppo that supposedly secures everybody's rights. But what, the reason why we're having this bloody webinar series is because mm. there's been a really interesting shift or really interesting move in the context of South Africa where we are, we are all free, but like George Orwell's Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether media in South Africa is playing that capacitating role, as it were, of propositioning for that wholesale emancipation, right? Whereby we are indeed all equal and there is no qualifier that says some are more equal than others, right? And, 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 and if that's the case, how is the media doing that work, right? Of, of facilitating that imaginative space where we begin to unlearn the behaviors of entitlement, mm. the behaviors of abuse, the behavior, and we get away in many respects from the socialization chat. Because I think that the socialization chat for me in any case, is curious because it absconds from the, from the question of assumption of responsibility, mm -hmm. right? So, but that's another question. But the, the question I'm pressing now is this question of, does the media facilitate that imaginative space where we can authentically see women as citizens in and of themselves as carrying a particular kind of right that mm -hmm. is inalienable, which we as men have, and when we are challenged on that inalienable right, we feel threatened and we respond with violence, right? Yeah. So, so, so how does the media facilitate this kind of wholesale emancipation as it were? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the point that I raised earlier on about the media being a reflection of society, right? And what we tell you in the news is a reflection of society. Um, but what happens inside the news building <laughs> is also a reflection of society. So when we decide on an angle, for instance, which story should we go for and how, what, should the, what, should the, what should the angle of that story be? Those are all things that are informed by the way we live, the way we breathe, the way we understand human beings and the way we understand each other as well. There needs to be though, I believe, a deliberate effort in understanding what do we as the media say about the role that women are supposed to play? Yeah, because we also need to say of women that there is something that we expect of you um, mm -hmm. as the media. 
An example would be if I say um, we're going to have a panel panel conversation around, um, let's say, finances or the JSC, what, what, whatever. I must be able to say, do I deliberately and make a concerted effort to find a female voice to this conversation? Mm -hmm. Because we now need to we now need to elevate the women and the understanding of the women as just being the because through, through gender-based violence the woman is the constant victim so constantly she is being portrayed as the victim in the time that you'd mostly find if, if you probably if you were to do um, an audit of all news stories like let's say if you go for the past week for instance look at all the news stories and just audit the story um, audit these stories you'd find that the moments where women's voices are being heard as an authoritative voice on a particular subject would be on issues of gender-based violence or issues in relation to just women. So it's Women's Month. You'll probably see a lot of women on TV. You'll probably see a lot of women in newspapers and so forth. But even when we speak about women if during, during Women's Month, you'd find that um, it would be a profile of a woman. Mm -hmm. And the it just ends at that. It ends at there is this woman who has achieved all of these things, but doesn't tell us beyond this woman and her achievement, what does it mean being women? So what we constantly do is that we constantly go back to the default position that you only go to women when we speak about issues related to women or we speak about gender-based violence. And that for me is the difficulty having to go out and deliberately find these voices and to be quite purposeful around it as well. How do we do it? And what type of voices is it again? You know, because that's another question. Yeah. Yeah. What type of voices do you put on air? What should those voices articulate? What's, in, what's important in, 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 in the messaging that those voices are sending to society? To society? Are we putting on women who only come in in the form of, of protest? So they come into a debate only to antagonize? Why are we doing that? Because then you weaponize women again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, it goes back to me as you're speaking, I, I, I think about Diane Victor's work right behind me here and and how Diane sort of mm. talks to the question of identity formation and identity re-articulation, right? And she does that in, in, in interesting ways through presenting for us the monument, right? The Fuertreca monument. And she presents, us, she presents it to us as in a process of decay and collapse in many instances. And that's why the aesthetic realm for me becomes so important, right? Because it's not just about a pretty picture that's hanging up in, you know, behind me or that's in the 101 Javit UP art collection that's on display at the moment. These sort of artworks that we have tell certain kinds of stories. If you think of the work of Pierre Neef, for instance, Pierre Neef told a particular kind of story about the South African landscape that justified colonial dispossession in this country, right? Where he erased the existence of blackness in these vast landscapes, these beautifully vast landscapes that he depicts. If you think about the work of Dumile Feni, Dumile Feni is in many respects interrogating, beautifully interrogating the question of black subjectivity in the South African context through his series of artworks that he presents. If we think about contemporary artists, um, yeah, who, uh, you know, if you think about the work of Alexander, what Jane Alexander, right, and, 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 and the kind of images that she produces, Billy Bester, the kinds of sculptures that he produces, these are people who are making a social critique. And I wonder whether or not we have neglected, right, the, 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 the capacity of storytelling in being able, first and foremost, to refashion the kinds of stories that we tell about ourselves and the society, to go back to Ben Okri's work, right? To say, if you want to poison a nation, poison its mm -hmm. stories. Because as you say, there's a particular narrative that we have of women in South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And that narrative is cut and paste and has been the same for the longest while, for the last two decades of freedom and democracy in this country. Is it not time to get rid of that story and bring in a new story that might be fictitious? Yes, as Bacon Autry says, you know, he says that the greatest leaders in society tell fictions 
of that society that give that society a certain sense of pride and identity mm. in who they are? Is it not a time maybe right now with everything that's happening in our country to tell fictions about South Africa that don't rest on this question of suffering, victimhood, and violence? I wonder. Mm. That then goes back to a question around um, how do we, how, how, what is news, number one? Mm. And um, how do we define news? So ordinarily we would be told that, hey, news is something new. Mm. So it is a, a collection of just news stories and that's why it is news. But then comes the next level and the next level is um, what is the strong story? You know, what is um, the headline grabber? And what we have done, and I don't know if it is generally across the world, um, we have argued, um, or the, the people, well, our predecessors, because this is what we found as well, getting into the new space, is a space that says that blood cells, you know how in advertising they say sex cells? Yeah. In new, it is blood cells. So if it is bloody, if it is gruesome, if it is gory, those are the type of things that we are told sell. We are told that this is what you as the audience would like to read. But then you look at society and you know, but is it really the case? Is it really the case that constantly people want to hear negative stories? I don't think so. We have been lazy, I would say, as the media to actively try and make good stories, interesting stories. Because you, you, people would speak about sunshine journalism. Sure, we can speak about sunshine journalism, but there is something more that we have to do. How do you make this story interesting? So with the, with the, with, with the story about blood, 25 bodies, um, have been found, gunned down. You don't have to do any work. There's not much you have to do. All you have to do is just report on what you're seeing. Mm. And that, that alone is interesting already. Now people want to know more about it. But what about the good stories? Why aren't we going the extra mile? Like what about a open brain surgery Why the woman is playing a, a violin? I find that quite interesting. Right. How, did, how did they do that? But those are the type of stories that are not seen to be interesting. And what I like about social media now is that social media has disrupted that. You would have go on to social media sometimes and find that um, somebody, Ose, Ose Kwakwa, for instance, who is the first whatever, and that person being celebrated on social media. So social media shows you that there is space for these stories to exist. However, the mainstream media is telling you, uh-uh, there is no space for these stories to exist. We'll have the story probably right at the end. It will be part of our end finalities. <laughs> you know? but, but why can't why can't that story be the lead? Why is the lead story of good news only in moments like when when we had when we won the the when we won the rugby world cup? Is that it? Are we saying that there are no other good stories about the country that are worthy of being on the front page? Are we mm. saying there are no good stories out there that are worthy to be part of the lead stories? Are we arguing that as a country we are so depressed and we are so, we, we, we just drenched in blood and agony that every time we speak about the lead story, the lead story should be about blood. It should be about loss. What about achievement and this is something that you know i think was a curious debate that defined the south african landscape in the late 1990s and early 2000s where the literary giants in the country zoe wickham and njabulo ndebele were responding to this question of the kind of story that south africa tells itself right um and and of course they were talking specifically to the novel right so they were not necessarily talking about media or news houses etc but they were talking about this the, the kind of story that we tell ourselves through the south african novel to a point where njabulo ndebele makes a pertinent conversation or makes a pertinent point rather or observation around this idea of having to rediscover the ordinary, right? So he did that book, that gorgeous book, I think in 2001, where he titles it The Rediscovery of the Ordinary. And he says that we've got to move away from spectacle. 
And, and, and that brings me to my next question, right, which is to say, what do you make of the claim, for instance, that the ways in which we treat femicide, the femicide debate in South Africa, feeds into spectacle? Right. So if you think about the case of if you think about the case of Karabo, if you think about the case of Sohova um, Pule, um, for instance, this year, you know, there's, 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 there's the spectacle that is associated with this violence. And in many instances, I wonder how much as a society we are feeding into that desire for that bloody spectacle. Right. Um, and, and what do we make? How do we how do we, for instance, report on such a story without creating a spectacle, without creating this dramatized narrative that in many respects has played itself out so often in the South African narrative and in the South African national discourse that it is becoming, it is becoming the go-to conversation around. Because if, if there is a story, if, if a woman is trending in this country, it's either one of two things, as you say. It's because she's, been, she's achieved something and there's nothing more that's being said about her other than her great achievement. And also, by the way, um, you know, how great this achievement comes from pain. And I think about, for instance, mm -hmm. Amanda Damuza's Baked in Pain, right? Yeah. Um, here is this amazing black woman who's doing so excellently and so well for herself. Mm -hmm. But the backstory is a story of suffering, it is a story of anguish, it is a story of pain. How do we move away from that spectacle? I think, because in many instances, it feeds into a very, you know, to go back to Ben Okri once again, it feeds into that poisoned narrative that poisons the nation, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty with, the, with this particular one is what I've realized when it comes to um, GBV cases, and I don't know if, if you've picked up the same thing, is um, so, Tarabo um, Mokwena, you have that incident that happens, um, and um, the charred body remains are then found. And what happens then after that, the cycle of news is going to give us story after story after story after story after story of another woman and another woman and another woman and another woman and another woman. But then something happens, and then poof, it disappears mm -hmm. almost as if now we've dealt with gender-based violence gender-based violence is now an issue of the past whereas in actual fact we know that leading up to the days of Karabo Mugwena's death and days after Karabo Mugwena's death the women continue to die femicide continued to 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 to, 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 um, to exist so I don't know which, what our right approach should be when it comes to specifically focusing on gender-based violence, because there are moments where we ignore some of those gender-based violence stories and we wait for society to tell us that this is actually a major story and then we pick up the story, but then, then along the way, then the story, this, this, the story dies down. I don't know what the right approach is when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. How do you make sure which is that debate is not a debate that dies down and that debate, well, the other day I was speaking about um, a struggle. When we speak about a struggle, um, we, we must know that each struggle needs a face. Mm -hmm. What we don't have is that our struggles don't have a face. We have incidents of struggle and then we move on. Like, there is the whole um, trial that happens and um, the guy is then convicted and that's, that's the end of it. So a sense of justice towards, a sense of justice that one family feels um, is then portrayed as a sense of justice for the entire society, society mm -hmm. when in actual, in actual fact it is not. It is just dealing with a specific family who have suffered a specific loss and then the justice system kicked in whether we liked what happened or not, um, there's the conviction that, that then takes place. And is that then the end of the story? Mm, mm. Does and the that story means... really end there? When we speak about reform, reform does not mean the individual. Reform means beyond the individual, meaning that people who come after this, after the, 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 this face that we've chosen and said that this is the face of the struggle, that people beyond that should also benefit from this struggle. So we don't have that. So we, so we don't even have um, outcomes and say that these are the outcomes that, we, that we'd like to achieve. Yeah. And if there are the outcomes that, that um, activists um, have come up with, 
what people who are in these spaces have come up with, have done the research and so forth, why aren't those translated into the media so that the media also understand that this is the end goal? The end goal okay, is but as you said, as you said, Eldrin, we are doing the we're doing the hard work in the yeah, back end, yeah. doing the research, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess in many instances we we, I, I don't know, we, maybe, maybe we as researchers, activists and academics who are involved in this kind of work lack the lexicography to sexify the story in terms of, you know, coming to you guys and saying, here's the end goal, here's, because in many yeah. instances, a lot of the stuff that we produce ends up being bogged down in academic jargon, because in many instances we are writing reports, for instance, the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, or we're writing stuff for the Department of uh, Women, Children and People with Disabilities, or, you know, we, we're feeding somebody who's paying our bills at the end of the day and is funding our research ag agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that particular individual maybe might have said, this is the kind of research that I want you to do, right? When you're doing this kind of thing. But, but that, that, that's a conversation for another day. I wanna, I, wanna ra I wanna wrap up our conversation with a contentious question, I think, um, which is this question of intimacy and the public consumption of a case of femicide, right? So, if you think about, as you say, I, 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 I think about, and I'm going to share something here. I think about Uyinem Khoyana's mother, um, yeah. for instance, a very good friend of mine um, and a, a dear, dear colleague of mine. And, and when that situation played itself out, now, Namangwan is a psychologist, right? She's a trained psychologist and she actually works on the question of mourning. Right. Um, and when that thing played itself out of her losing her daughter, I was curious about the constant barrage of the media wanting to talk to her, the president going down to the Eastern Cape. There's that image of the president sitting or, or in their living room. Um, there's this, there's this bombardment, right? There's, the, 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 the femicide victim becomes this public poster child, denying the family the capacity to observe the rites and rituals that are attendant with burial and, and, and processes of mourning, yeah. right? In terms of we've lost somebody, we as, for instance, the Kumala family adhere to certain kinds of rituals when somebody is dead, we lose that because media are at our doorstep asking us for interviews asking us questions the politicians descend like freaking vultures on a carcass um there is no sense of dignity i find yeah. there is no sense of i suppose the beauty of saying goodbye to somebody yeah. in an intimate kind of way Mm -hmm. And I wonder, as you say, I know, I know you'd said that you don't quite have a, a, a response to how we report on these issues, but I, I wonder if I can pick your, if I can have a penny for your thoughts on that particular mm -hmm. question of how do we balance these two competing positions? On the one hand, the need to report on this violent crime that has been committed in society, but on the other hand, respecting, as I say, the attendant rites and rituals that come with mm -hmm. the interment of the dead. Yeah. Okay, so the reason that the the reason that the president would have been there, or any other politician would have been there, is it not true? Is it it's because of um, the media having covered the story, and um, how the media has focused on the story, and how the media has done follow ups on this story on this story, and therefore the politician might just feel that let me be seen. Uh, to empathize with the family. Let me go and pay my respects to the family. But we know that all of this is happening in a space where we know that we've got the camera lenses on us. So we must be seen to be grieving with the family as well, that we are, we are mourning with the family as well, because this is a loss to our society. And as, a, as the president of the country, here I am. But I just want to flip it quickly and ask that 
if there is this opportunity, and I don't want to take away the sense of loss that you that that the family has ex has experienced and the pain and the grief that they that they're going through, here you have the president of the country um, sitting in your living room. What do you do with that moment? Do you guys have a conversation as a family to say that hey guys, the president is coming? What's our message to the president? What is it that we want to see of the president do going forward? Is there anything that we can get the president to commit to as a family that is experiencing this particular loss? Because in that moment, you are not just only um, a family that has lost a loved one, but you are a reflection of families that have lost loved ones because of gender-based violence. So here you have the number one citizen in your living room, what do you do with that? My quick response to that, the Elgin, is to say, and I'm not going to speak for the Mkhoyana family, I think that that would be presumptuous and, and very, very arrogant of me. But confronted with a similar situation, um, I, and maybe, maybe this is just me, who's incredibly private mm -hmm. and, 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 and 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 and, but I, yeah. I I wouldn't I wouldn't want mm -hmm. the president in in my living. Room. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want the media in my living room. And the yeah. reason why I say this is because the reason why I say this is because, in so far as that moment presents itself as an mm -hmm. opportunity to really make a submission, as it were, yeah. I am a firm believer whether one is whether one adheres to modernity through Christian, through Christian values and ideals, or whether one adheres to tradition in terms of the rites and rituals that we keep when, when we are faced with that particular moment of the interment of the dead, there, there is a certain sense of sacredness. There is a certain sense of mourning that ought to be observed by the family outside of this public display. And again, I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not responding on behalf of the Mkhoyanas. I'm just saying if I were, if I were in that kind of context, I honestly mm -hmm. wouldn't. I, in fact, I would, I would, I would, I would plead yeah. with those who would attempt to organize such a visit to say, please do not. Um, <laughs> because, because there's, there's, there's a certain sense of respect that we have to keep, yeah. I think, for the dead. Yeah. And you yeah. know what, as, as, as a family, um, you guys, you, the family would have that agency um, mm -hmm. to say, no, uh, we don't want anyone around the house. And, and when I say taking, um, taking this opportunity with both hands, I do not discount that this is quite invasive, that having this politician in your house is it's quite invasive because he does not come along. He comes with an entourage of people. You understand, so it be, it does become quite invasive, and it takes away from the process the pro, the process of 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 of, of um, the process of mourning. But then we also have these cameras. So you've got about five six cameras that are on you. So you've got about six million eyeballs um, that that's watching your family, right? And even when we speak about the the funeral. The funeral process itself, some may argue, is quite invasive um, because of so many people who come to pay their last respects. And some people now with COVID-19 would tell you that we actually enjoyed just being the family and reflecting on our loss and so forth. So it was, it was, it was the healing process uh, was much smoother um, than, for instance, a previous experience or anything, anything of that nature. But here you have cameras that are on you as a family. And I know that this is tough and difficult to ask of a family that is grieving. What do you do with those six million eyeballs? Mm. Those are people who are watching you. Mm. So you decide as a family that what is our message as a family? Because remember that even at the funeral, it's the family that decides who will speak. But the family is also speaking to people that are strangers to the person who is speaking. Yes. But those people are not strangers to the person who, who is deceased. So I think if you apply that same thought process around the cameras being around you, I think there you can try and make sure that we, that we push the narrative around, um, around, around GBV. Because what happens with the conversation around GBV is 
most of the time we get to speak to um, we get to speak to, to to the experts about GBV. You hardly hear the voice of the victim of GBV in the news, and that's understandable. Sometimes probably they decide not to speak, but when they do speak, is the media able to give them an extended time to have their say? You know. Mm -hmm. And when that opportunity does present itself, I say as a family, you should take it up. You decide as a family that this is our family spokesperson and therefore the family spokesperson will articulate the position of the family and what the family thinks about gender-based violence. This is our contribution as a family to the debate around gender-based violence and how we end it. Because the people who experience gender-based violence are able to tell you it's more nuanced right they're able to bring out things that you've never thought of before um things that the expert has never thought of before probably the expert watching this uh, watching this interview thinking oh my word that is an interesting aspect that she brings she brings up i must do some research on that as well yeah yeah thanks for that Aldrin. and uh i'm certain this is not the last of this conversation that you're having mm -hmm. um as a way forward, as we continue with this conversation, mm -hmm. both as experts, as those who are charged with telling the narrative of this country, as journalists, um, and just the everyday citizen who might necessarily come across this conversation, what do you want to say to all of us um, in terms of what would you like to see us do differently, maybe? Um, or what would you like to see us do better, I wonder? Cancel culture. Uh -huh. you deal with the concept of cancel culture because cancel culture expects of human beings to be perfect. Human beings are not perfect. That's the reason why we have the learning process and the unlearning process. And yesterday, thinking about today's conversation, I thought about if you look at the schooling system, for instance, the schooling system, you go in, you get taught something, and there is a test that then takes place after the test. There is the correction process that takes place, but the correction process is not only the process that gives you a, a right or wrong. The correction process does the right and wrong, but also then goes a step further, especially when it's wrong, to say why it is wrong, and this is how you can fix it. So the cancel culture seems to forget that that aspect also applies in ordinary life, social life, our interactions as human beings when we are wrong, what do we do with somebody who has wronged us? How do we correct, um, how do we correct that behavior? There's also this, the idea that I raised earlier on about a sense of loss. Um, I don't have a word for it as, as yet, but it's, 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 a, it's a, a three-tiered approach, call it a, like a triangle. You have dignity on one hand, you have, you have identity on one hand, which intersects with the sense of entitlement because I'm a Sampia, this is what my family stands for, so this is my identity, and therefore because I'm a Sampia, these are the things that I'm entitled to. So there's the sense of entitlement that we do have because of our identity and how we present ourselves. I'm a South African, so there are certain things that I'm entitled to. But then there's also the idea of, of justice. And when we speak about our dignity, having been stripped of our dignity and being stripped of your, of your identity, and now you seek justice, what happens when you do not get the justice that you feel is fit? Again, it goes back to the question of, are we okay with the sense of losing? Are you able to pull yourself up again after losing? even in moments of a fit of rage, because those things are always going to exist. We now need to teach each other to be okay with losing. You now need to teach each other with being okay with, um, well, not really being okay, but, but being able to uh, be resilient um, in moments where we feel that we've been stripped of our dignity, but that stripping of the dignity does not necessitate a retaliation through a form of violence. I think it's really important what you say of cancel culture and the problematic nature in which cancel culture functions in society. I might be cancelled myself for saying this, but I do think that cancel culture... <laughs> we cancel both might culture, be cancelled. <laughs> um, cancel culture is very childish, right? Um, 
It's childish in the sense that it expects things to exist in spaces of black and white, whereas mm -hmm. there's a lot of gray in this world that exists in between. Um, and this is not to justify problematic behavior, and this is not to justify, uh, but there is a lot of gray. We're humans. And I, I think feel that it's cowardice, eh? I feel, I feel that there's a sense of cowardice because what you do when you cancel somebody, you don't have to deal with their behavior anymore. Exactly. exactly. Um, but, the, but the problem, I think, with that is, you know, go back to the Jewish conversation post the Holocaust in Germany. Mm. Jews were told, forgive, but never forget. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they were told never to forget is such that we never repeat the same history. Yeah. And, and I think that cancel culture feeds into the forgetfulness, which means that we are then along the line somewhere bound to repeat precisely the exact same mistakes because we've canceled that behavior, because there's no reminder to say mm -hmm. this is where we come from. This is the story as humanity that we've told mm -hmm. ourselves. Where do we want to go from here? Because yeah. we know that we might have messed up. Uh, it also the effect of censorship, eh? I know. And yet we claim to be living in a democratic society. <laughs> in 2018, no, in 2017, we had uh, Karabomukwen, the case of yeah. In 2018, it was the case of Kensani Maseko. She didn't necessarily die because she was killed by somebody. She died because she took her own life as a result of having mm -hmm. suffered sexual assault. In the case mm -hmm. of 2019, it was the case of Funen Mkhoyana. In the case of 2020, it's the case of Tsekhova Tupule. So I'm, I was just, I was, I, 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 I yearn for a day or for a year in this country where we don't have a woman who trends because she's, mm. because she's dead. Mm. Like, I, 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 like there's, there's something in me that says that for me would be a signal mm. of healing in this country, mm. of, of a sense of we are getting better. Mm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I yearn for a day where, that, where we can get to that. Point. And that's why we're having these conversations. And we, we, we are sort of hoping to continue the conversation next year as well, mm. as the Department of Political Science is in conversation with the Javit UP Art Center. Because I think it's a, useful, it's a useful contribution to have. I think you should yearn for a day when no woman is abused, not when an abused woman is trending. <laughs> I know. Uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> of course. Of course. I, 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 I say yes if it, let, 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 let this thing be out there. If this incident happened, let it trend. Let we have this conversation. Mm. Um, but but we need to always go back again to the issue around what is the root cause what's the yeah. root cause of, of of violence and i hope that we're able to to get there and mm -hmm. um to end the cycle as well because uh, what would you say just just just, a, just, becomes the, uh? just literally as a parting shot what would you say is the root cause of this violence um what what would be the root cause of violence do you know what the root cause of violence is hmm? It is telling men that they are strong. When you go onto Google and search masculinity, for instance, the imagery that you'll get there is of biceps and, you know, even in the illustrations, that's what you get. When, we, when I searched for femininity as well, the images of femininity, and I wasn't clear what the image of femininity was. Was there a globally accepted image of femininity and what femininity represents? And I couldn't get there. But with masculinity, it was quite clear that it is about strength. But strength is also that it's it's also about power. Um, mm. James Brown's song, "It's a Man's Man's World." One of the lyrics along the lines of, um, "Men make the money to spend on other men." Something not not to spend on or to buy from other men. So men yeah. make the money to buy from other men. So that's that cycle again. You know. It's that cycle again. It's a man. It's a man. It's a man. It's a man. It's a, it's, it's, it's a man's world. So I think, um, gents, if we get to a point of um, dealing with the issue of having the strength, the physical strength that you know that inherently this is what you have. You are born. You are born with it. But if you accept it as this is a form of power, when we accept something as a form of power, we are then being taught how to use that power responsibly. But we are not doing that. Mm. And I don't think we even have the conversation around um, healthy masculinities or using yeah. power responsibly. I don't think that's a feature in a lot of the conversations around 
the socialization of masculinities, which is one of the reasons why, for instance, in a conversation with a colleague of mine, uh, a colleague and a friend of mine, Croatia Suleiman, uh, Dr. Suleiman, I, I raised this question of as a black, as, as, as young black men, right? Mm. In our 20s and our 30s, do we have as, I don't know, I, 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 I honestly don't know, and this is why I put the question, but do we have, do we grow up with a healthy prototype of masculinity? Um, because even when we do grow up, so even if the father is around, it's either he's abusive or his presence is defined by an absence or some form of violence, yeah. right? Um, because black men grew up, our father's generation grew up in very problematic kinds of ways of relating to black, to blackness and, and their mm -hmm. own. So I wonder, I really do wonder if we can ever say that we have a sense of masculine, healthy masculinities that are modeled as we grow up as children. And I think maybe we, as this generation, need to be that for our children. Yeah, but, right? that, but that then also expects of you to be honest to be honest with yourself, to be honest with society, to be honest about your experiences and even um, your past problematic experiences and how you grew out of that. But cancel culture doesn't allow for that. Cancel culture says that once you even attempt doing that, just know that you after that you are totally canceled. I have a friend of mine, for instance, now is like, oh my God, friend, you know, everywhere I go, people are like, why am I friends with you? Because you are an abuser. I'm like, but... I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think that I should be learning something um, and society can learn something from me as well. And we could be teaching each other the concept of healthy masculinity. Is it okay for me to go on air and cry? Is that okay? You know, can we allow that to, 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 to when, when we speak about, um, um, again, going back to this issue around loss, speak about mourning, for instance, um, in our, our tradition, for instance, our cultures, we are told mm -hmm. So umama uzilile, which immediately says to you, your approach needs to be different. Yes. Yeah? So yes. yes. a sense of care and um, a sense of empathy that, that, that is there as well. Does that thing exist for, now I'm just speaking about funeral now and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, losing a family member. Does that thing exist for men where this person has, let's speak about the husband. The husband has lost his wife. But when he goes out into society, we just see a man. Historically, historically, yeah. it, 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 there was, there, there is in Zilo for a Lisa, right? Mm. And, 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 it, and it, it comes in the form of a hat and that black band around the arm and yeah. a coat, right? So, so mm. that would be this idea or this declaration to society that I am a widower, yeah. I have lost my partner. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that you raise this question of Uzila because the way in which we relate to a mourning man, mm -hmm. in contrast to the way in which we relate to a mourning woman, are very mm -hmm. different. Um, even when the man has those attendant adornments that signal that this is someone who is in mourning, right? We still... There's a very different, and in many instances, I wonder, I always wondered, right? Because I grew up in the rural outbacks of KZN. When I saw a man in, in clad in mourning attire, I always wondered the question, because for a woman, it's always, she's mourning. And for us, the whole respectability politics comes into play. Yeah. She keeps her distance, especially in the most traditional societies. She keeps her distance from society. She, in fact, acts as though she is cast out as mm -hmm. if she's ostracized. Do you remember the whole idea of Unumvula Mugunyane when she was grieving yeah. and then she goes and speaks at the funeral or at the memorial mm -hmm. service of, um, I forget what was that, that guy's name. And everybody was like, what is Numvula doing? Uzili. She needs to be staying in her place. She needs to, be, you, you know, there was, there was that whole entire chat, especially from mm -hmm. traditional circles. Yeah. But a man, on the other hand, it was as if he was advertising, well, if my wife is dead, I'm now free. 
right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a very curious yeah. way. And for me, that goes back to that question of the reimagination, right? Mm -hmm. How do we flip the script? How do we tell ourselves new stories that are different? Yeah, because the, the thing about that is that masculinity would say that I dictate how you mm. experience As a me. woman will mourn, yes. Mm -hmm. So I dictate how you experience me in even this particular moment. Mm -hmm. um, but when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to the experience of women, um, we, we, she doesn't get to dictate that. Um, you are in mourning. We are told that therefore we will decide how we um, interact with you. Yeah. And that's yeah. the problem yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Elgin, thank you so much. Thank you so much, my good sir. We could go on for hours. Yeah, uh, I am really enjoyed incredibly this, grateful. I am incredibly grateful. Ah, definitely. Thank you so much, eh? Thank you, Elgin. Have a good one. Bye.